In last Sunday's Gospel, we heard at the beginning of what scholars like to refer to as Jesus' inaugural sermon in his hometown of Nazareth. You remember he went into the synagogue, as was his custom on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read, just as our lectors do week by week, and he was given a scroll with the book of the prophet Isaiah in it. And he opened the scroll and he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Eternal is upon me, for God has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. God has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the eternal. And as all the eyes in the synagogue were glued on him, he went and he sat down to begin his teaching. And he looked around and he said, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. That is where our gospel reading this morning picks up. It's part two of this same story, right there. And we hear how the, the people gathered there initially uh, responded very positively to Jesus. I mean, after all, he was reading from one of their beloved prophets, Isaiah, this gorgeous passage. But then when he begins to elucidate the passage, to share what he saw its implications to be, they turn on him like that. So what made the Nazarenes so angry? Well, part of it may have been that they weren't that much different than a lot of modern day Christian churchgoers. They thought they had a special relationship with God, that they were God's chosen out of all the peoples and nations of the earth. And in fact, those of other nations uh, stood outside of God's law and were considered unclean sinners not worthy uh, to be eaten with. They, uh, they were special. But we have to also admit, Jesus was in no way what I would call a pastoral preacher. In other words, he didn't preach to make people feel good. He preached to open up, to crack open uh, the realm of God and its, its implications. To those who would exclude others, to those who were self-righteous, to those who um, were only concerned with enforcing rules, Jesus meant no words. And he didn't make any attempt to try to calm their anger or soothe their egos. The sober truth that is, is, if Jesus were doing his earthly ministry in, in this day and age among us Christians, um, I can't think of a single church that would call him as a rector or a bishop. <laughs> he wouldn't say the right things. And um, I had a friend from seminary that uh, spent all of his ministry back in Virginia, and I was visiting one time years ago. We both happened to be getting ready to preach on this passage, and I'll never forget. He said, you know, I'm going to point out to my congregation that I've preached a number of sermons throughout my life, uh, many of which were quite good, he said of himself, um, some of which were real duds. But he said, I have yet to preach a sermon where afterwards the congregation dragged me to the edge of town in order to lynch me. And I said, well, maybe you just haven't reached the level of our Lord's preaching yet. <laughs> you see, Jesus went for the juggle. He turned to their sacred scriptures, and we all love our scriptures, right? And they knew their scripture. And Jesus says to the congregation, remember the widow at the time of Elisha. Well, of course they did. There had been a drought for three and a half years, and she and her son were uh, dying of hunger. And God sends the prophet Elijah to her, and um, Elijah asks her to prepare him a meal. And she's like, you've got to be kidding. Me. But she took the little, the next to nothing, literally, that she had, and she said, okay, 
I'll, I'll do what I can do, and then my son and I will just die. But God provided for her and her son and for Elijah until the rains came and the drought was over. It's a wonderful story. But Jesus points out to the congregation that there were many widows in the land of Israel at that time. And yet, God sent Elijah to this widow from Zarephath in sight. In other words, God's saving power was shown not to an Israelite, but to a Sidonian. And that is not something the congregation would have enjoyed hearing. Now, I don't know if Jesus just didn't have the gift of reading a room, but he didn't leave well enough alone. He wants to make sure they get the point. So he reminds them of Naaman, and they would have known Naaman too. Naaman was a great man of uh, great power, except he contracted leprosy. And that was a disease that would ruin your life, not only your physical health, but it also cut you off from society. You would be shunned. You would lose all power and all influence. And Naaman had done many things to try to get cured of this, all to no avail. But finally he goes to uh, Elijah's successor, the prophet Elisha. And Elisha tells him, go wash in the Jordan River seven times. What has he got to lose? He does it, and lo and behold, he's cured. But you see, Naaman was a Syrian. And not only that, he was the commander of the army of the king of Syria. And Jesus has the effrontery to remind the gathered congregation that there were many lepers in the land of Israel at that time. But God's healing touch came to none of them. Only this powerful enemy of Israel. So I hope it, you can understand in verse 28 when it says, When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They, they had had enough. Jesus had uh, managed to insult them all. And Luke wants us to know that this is the central message that Jesus has to preach. You know, where I, where I grew up, we would, to put the best light on what happened in that synagogue, we would have said, well, Jesus was at least being tacky. To bring all that stuff up. But Luke wants us to know that at the heart of Jesus is his teaching is this message. And he wants it to be loud and clear, just as Jesus did in that synagogue. And the message is that God's love has no bounds. And that anyone who tries to claim a monopoly on that love stands opposed to God. For Luke, the good news of salvation through Christ is that in the realm of God there are no outcasts except those who exclude themselves because of refusing to join the others. And there's a corollary to this, that once the doors begin to open on this all-inclusive love of God, there will be opposition. And the, the church in Luke's time would have uh, been very edified to hear that because they were experiencing opposition on all sides from their Jewish brothers and sisters and from the Roman authorities. And they were realizing that if this good news of God from Christ was to go out in all directions, it meant that they had to be willing to risk in order to make it so. So that was the reality some 2,000 years ago. But you know, I don't think the reality has changed much, has it? If we want the all-inclusive love of God that we have known through Christ 
to uh, ripple out in this crazy, insane society we live in, then you and I, those who call themselves Christians, must be willing to risk in order to make it happen. But before we are willing, we've got to decide if we want to. If, if we want this kind of community that Jesus described this morning, do we want to be in a community where Israeli and Palestinian is welcomed and cherished equally? Do we want a community where Ukrainian and Russian are welcomed and cherished equally? I'll make it harder for you. Do we want a community where Democrat and Republican are welcomed and cherished equally? Luke makes it abundantly clear that the gospel is firmly set in the context of ministry, a ministry of welcome and reaching out to the outsider, to whomever we consider beyond the pale of God's love. That is the good news that Jesus, that Luke heard Jesus proclaim. So I have no doubt that we will not respond with quite violent uh, opposition to that message that the church in Nazareth, the synagogue in Nazareth did. But on the other hand, will we just be indifferent? Will we simply ignore it? Or are we willing to join in Jesus' ministry? To walk in the footsteps of those first century Christians? Are we willing to say with Jesus and Isaiah before him, the spirit of the eternal is upon us because God has anointed us to proclaim, to preach good news to the poor. God has sent us to proclaim liberty to the captive, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the eternal. Are we ready? Are we ready to have this scripture fulfilled in our hearing and in our doing? I pray and I believe that we are through Jesus Christ our Lord.